our seats, please. This is May 20th, 2016, uh, 2019. Santa Barbara City Council, our budget hearing. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please, uh, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Dominguez. Here. Councilmember Rouse. Here. Councilmember Sneddon. Mayor Pro Tem Friedman. Here. Councilmember Harmon. Here. Councilmember Gutierrez. Here. And Mayor Maria. Here. Councilmember Sneddon is coming from one of her water agency assignments. So, um, what is the item today, Ms. Clerk? If you would read it. Item number two, subject, fiscal year 2020 recommended operating and capital budget. Mr. Casey, it's um, fire and police today. Okay, and we're starting with fire. Chief Nickel. That is correct. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Honorable Council Members, uh, Eric Nickel, Fire Chief, uh, here to present uh, with my colleagues from the Fire Department uh, our proposed uh, budget for fiscal year 20. So let's go ahead and get started with our PowerPoint presentation. So we've got uh, five things we wanna cover with you today. The first is our overview. Uh, the next is our proposed fiscal year plan, uh, proposed fee changes, uh, as well as our capital budget. And then I will finish up with some key initiatives uh, and uh, projects and performance objectives for the for year 2020. So a little department overview. Uh, we're committed to ensuring the safety and protection of our community through the preservation of life, property, and the environment. We always like to start everything that we do with our mission statement to remind everyone what we're all about. This is the organizational chart. We have seven programs, three funds, and 106 FTEs. And if you recall last year, uh, the council approved uh, the new position for uh, Liliana's uh, public outreach position, which you see there beneath the emergency services manager, the public education coordinator. Uh, I'm happy to announce, uh, I won't go into great detail because she will be here tomorrow in the council meeting to talk about the, the bilingual aspects of, of what uh, she has done. But between uh, her and, and Yoli, our emergency manager, uh, we have done um, four CERT trainings this year and trained a total of 73 people, 41 in English and 32 in Spanish. Um, we are leading the state in the LISTOS program, which really targets the Spanish-speaking community for disaster and emergency preparedness. Uh, we've done uh, three of those programs this year for a total of 60 Spanish-speaking residents. We've been present at every significant uh, community event with a public education information table. Um, and then we've conducted four community disaster education workshops totaling 110 participants. So pretty impressive numbers when you talk about the work that we're out there doing in the community to prepare uh, the community. Um, and again, we will go into that in much greater detail tomorrow. I know that the council will hear from the cool block folks, but I just wanted to let you know the work that our team has been doing to get the message out there around disaster preparedness. One of the hallmarks, uh, one of the uh, items of cool block is disaster preparedness, but I'm here to tell you that we're already doing a great deal of that through the fire department, really based upon some of the decisions you made last year in funding that public education outreach position. So the fire department has eight fire stations. We have seven within uh, here, the, the, the city limits. And then uh, we also are the fire department out at the airport. We work 48 hour shifts, two 24 hour shifts on. We have 29 positions assigned every day, 24 seven, 365. What you see here is the breakdown of the daily staffing with one battalion chief, the engine crew, the aircraft uh, rescue firefighting crew, and then the crew that cross staffs the truck rescue and the squad. So we have 29 fire personnel on duty on this uh, 48 hour shift uh, on a daily basis. We also have hourly employees and professional contractors. So we try to maximize the, the, the resources that we have, the budget dollars that we have. Uh, we don't require full-time positions for uh, a lot of these spots. We're able to uh, accomplish this with uh, some hourly staff. We are required uh, with our uh, medical program because our dispatchers 
If you recall when I was here uh, last week at the council meeting talking about the dispatch center, we do what's called emergency medical dispatch where the dispatchers can query to ascertain what type of call it is. We do have to have a medical director for that in order to use that program. It's a full-time medical doctor. He also oversees the EMT program to make sure that we're prepared and trained to the highest level of, of care possible. We have an EMS nurse educator who also provides a lot of the training for our staff and that's on an, on an hourly position. These next two positions are really supporting some of the technology needs within the fire department. You know, we're trying to be more efficient in how we use uh, the taxpayers' dollars. So um, there are some technology projects that we have working out there, whether it's our tablets that we track our, uh, our, our patient care records, our emergency response, we use as our computer-aided dispatch. We have smartphones within the fire apparatus, those types of things. And then the last position is basically our logistics position uh, that helps make sure that all the fire stations are fully stocked with medical supplies and, and, and the like uh, to operate these eight fire stations. So the fleet here, uh, we have uh, just a quick little snapshot of what types of vehicles we have within the fleet. Uh, we have 47 vehicles. Um, you know, 14 of those are, are the fire engines, uh, seven of those being frontline. We also have brush fire engines, the smaller fire engines, uh, to get up on the, on the narrow or dirt roads. We have two ladder trucks, one frontline and one reserve. You know, a community of this size to not be without a ladder truck to get up to higher uh, levels uh, just would not be uh, optimal, would not be safe for the, for the community. We have a combination uh, hazardous materials uh, vehicle that also uh, doubles as our to fill our air bottles at the scene of calls. These uh, next vehicles, squads and patrols, are smaller pickup type vehicles that have um, the, the patrols have uh, a small pump in them. We use those for uh, either patrolling or mopping up after, after brush fires. And then uh, the other vehicle that I want to point out, the ARF, ARFF, Aircraft uh, Rescue Firefighting, those are the big, large green vehicles, fire vehicles, suppression vehicles that are out at the airport that basically have to be uh, anywhere within the fence line of the airport within three minutes of notification uh, to uh, take care of any sort of aircraft uh, crash emergency. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague here, Ron, after uh, one last data point I wanted to give you um, that we felt would be important here that we didn't include in the slides. Just to give you a, a, a snapshot of the total calls for service last year, the fire department ran 10,341 calls for service last year. That's everything from a cat in a tree to a structure fire to a water rescue. Uh, of that, uh, 6,783 of those, or roughly 65%, two-thirds, were medical calls. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron to go over the, uh, the budget details. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. I am Ron Lichty, the Fire Department's Business Manager. I'm here to talk about the fiscal year 2020 plan with you. As you know, the fire department is composed of three primary funds, totaling uh, our proposed plan is for $29,866,000 this year. The general fund is 99% of our, uh, spendable, uh, our spendable funds, and that's at $29,556,000. And then we have a small fire equipment replacement fund and our wildland fire suppression fund. We'll begin by talking about our major fund, spend most of our time with uh, the general fund, our, our major fund here. And what we have here is uh, we're looking at um, overall $29.556 million recommended for fiscal year 2020. This chart is comparing the recommended 2020 to the fiscal year 2019 adopted budget. So the change from budget is $1,283,000 year over year or 4.5% increase. The majority of our general fund is spent in the salary and benefits category, and this represents 87% of overall costs. Now, this uh, category increased by 4.5%, and it's mostly due to um, increase. Well, we get these numbers from finance department. They are increasing our budget for a. Uh, they have adopted a 1% salary increase has been built into the budget. 1%. And then we also have um, uh, benefits increases. For example, 
our benefits increased for PERS 64% this year from 7.3 million to 6.5 million. And PERS is 28% of our salary and benefits right now, 28% of our budget. And we see um, projected for fiscal year 2021 another 7% increase over the 2020 budget for PERS. Allocated costs are those costs that the fire department pays for services received from other general fund and um, internal service fund departments. And we're seeing that uh, cost go up 3% this year to uh, 2.59, 2, 2, dollars Now, allocated costs are primarily vehicle replacement and maintenance costs, building maintenance costs for our fire stations, communications costs, and information technology costs. Of this $2.5 million, 62% of that is vehicle replacement and maintenance. So a lot of that is for our vehicles. And moving on to our supplies and services, we're recommending a budget of $794,000. That's a $100,000 increase over our adopted fiscal year 19, 2019 budget, or 14.5%. And why that went up is we are increasing um, $35,000 of this is for fuel charges. We've seen a dramatic increase in fuel supply costs. We're also, there was $18,000 for wellness medical exams for our firefighters. That was uh, part of their contract. We're increasing this budget $22,000 for our mobile data computer costs. That's the the mobile data computers that are on our fire engines. We have uh, quite a few subscriptions and licenses fees in that program, and those have increased $22,000 this year. We've also seen a, a dramatic increase, really, in the types of emergency medical supplies uh, where we have to have on board now uh, to provide to the public and for our firefighter safety, such as we have medical suits they now wear, non-latex gloves. Uh, we supply and house medicines such as Narcan, and we have a new stipulation requiring us to have pediatric automated external defibrillator pads for, for pediatrics. For equipment, we're keeping the budget at $122,000, no increase there. You may see projected is $141,000. That just represents a carryover from fiscal year 2018 budget into 2019. Some funds that had to be, that were encumbered and were spent in 2019. And uh, we have a final line, Special Projects Academy, that's our fire academy, and we're proposing to do, uh, should our staffing levels require it, another fire academy in the coming fiscal year for $300,000. Now another way to look at our fire department expenditures, that was by type of cost, like we, we call major object, but this is by our different programs. And so if we look at our programs, these are our programs, and if we combine our um, emergency response and firefighter suppression, that's our operations and aircraft rescue and firefighting, the two of those combined constitute 86% of our budget. So 86% of our budget is involved with direct uh, emergency response and fire suppression. And these numbers are all in your budget book, and they correlate to the numbers we just showed in total. Our other major fund is our Wildland Fire Benefit Assessment Fund, and we see that we're uh, recommending the budget to be $275,000 this year overall. That represents a $10,000 or 3.9% increase, and this corresponds to the Benefit Assessment District revenues that will be increasing by like amount. One item that did change in this budget was allocated costs. And it just turned out that the finance department calculations uh, for overhead allocation reduced by this amount this year. So uh, we see a reduction. Special projects, uh, th this is the work of the fund where we have uh, defensible space management, road clearance, and vegetation management. And special projects is going up $13,000 and that was the result of uh, half of a year's grant that we had received. In fact, fiscal year 2019, we received a $35,000 grant, so we applied that all into special projects. 
Now, the other side of our expenditures is revenues, and these are the revenues for the fire department. Overall, the revenues have uh, increased. We're proposing an increase of 3.6% to $29,866,000. The first fee is uh, fees and service charges. And these in fees and service charges we talked about in the finance uh, committee meeting uh, for proposed fee changes. And fees such as this include fire, company, engine inspections, building plan reviews, and issuing fire code permits. And we'll be talking more about these on a next, next slide. Interfund reimbursement. This is, a, this is the amount of money that we charge the airport for the fire protection services we provide to the airport. So these are expenses to the airport, and there are revenues. And they're going up by 1.7% this year. Intergovernmental happens to be a couple of grants we received in fiscal year 19. And we have more in the pipeline for fiscal year 20, but they just haven't been secured yet exactly, so we haven't budgeted them. Mutual aid reimbursements, we're keeping that figure for the recommended budget at $1 million, uh, just as it was in 2019, though we see in the fiscal year 2019 projected column $1.6 million. We had $600,000 more in mutual aid revenues than we had anticipated, and that's when we, our firefighters go out uh, where they're called for an incident outside our jurisdictional boundaries. We provide aid, and then we get reimbursed for the amount of money we uh, spend for our firefighters to go to that to that incident. It's conservative to keep that number at one million because otherwise uh, if we booked it at higher, uh, when we don't reach it, we'd be in a negative position. And then just to emphasize that the fire department is funded primarily by the general fund and by general fund ta taxes, you can see that we're recommending $25,200,000 is to be uh, the general fund subsidy. And overall, we're increasing the subsidy by 7.1% this year. And then just a couple of slides on uh, proposed fee changes. We increased our fees this year uh, across the board 3%, rounded to the nearest dollar, That's keeping up with, uh, um, C, uh, with consumer price index. I mentioned here we're conducting a uh, full cost recovery fee study uh, in the new fiscal year. The chief will have more to say about that. This just shows you what those fee changes mean on a level such as an engine company goes to inspect an apartment building that has three units in it, the fee went up from $29, $1 to $30. Or for example, issuing a permit uh, per the, the California Fire Code, we're changing that fee $5 up to $132 from $127. The rest of the fees are similar. And then we'll move on to the fire department's capital program. We've got one item in the capital program, and I'll just hand the narrative back to the chief. Thank you, Ron. So um, I, I love this picture here. Uh, this is Station Seven. This is our our fire station uh, up in the up in the hills. Um, it was built in 1952. Um, it's exceeded its useful lifespan. It is one of the kind of uh, capstone premier projects out of the Measure C funding. Um, it really hasn't dramatically changed uh, since 1952. Um, uh, I would invite you to uh, r drive up there with me one day and, and uh, come take a look inside the station and see what you know what, what the crew is dealing with there. Uh, we currently share that station with the United States Forest Service. They have a fire engine. They obviously have a great deal of land that they need to protect. Uh, we'd like to main continue to maintain that relationship with them. I've been meeting with the Forest Service chief to figure out what their funding uh, contribution would be uh, ongoing. Uh, the station overall in, in the in the Measure C Capital Program is is budgeted for right around ten million dollars, a little less than ten million. Uh, we're proposing in the Capital Program uh, about four hundred eighty. Five thousand to start the architectural design of the station. The station will be rebuilt on the existing site. There was some talk that maybe the station would move further down the road a little bit, but there were too many obstacles and uh, far too costly uh, uh, um, demolition to uh, uh, use the other location. So we will be rebuilding it uh, on the, the existing site. Obviously, if the if the cost is is too high, we will have to look uh, of a rebuild. We would have to look at 
at some alternatives, but we believe that we can get this station built within the existing uh, budget as as originally proposed under under Measure C. But the one capital item we are uh, asking for this year is, is to move that that project forward. Uh, if you do recall, um, we had gone through kind of the original development of the of the capital program, and this is before we knew we were going to get the Cal Fire uh, grant uh, that you will vote on tomorrow to accept that three hundred ten thousand dollar grant. That was also going to be included in this, but we were able to get Cal Fire to pay for that, therefore saving the the, the capital and the general fund three hundred ten thousand dollars because Cal Fire is going to prepare for that. Uh, is going to pay for that uh, community wildfire preparedness program uh, uh, grant. So this is the one capital item for for next year. So some key initiatives uh, that I that I do want to talk about. Uh, first, I do want to point out uh, on our budget summary on page G159, we do have a highlighted box there of a couple uh, budget highlights. Uh, we are currently in in the process, as is most of the city, with uh, upgrading our time and attendance recording and scheduling payroll system. Um, it's a system that I've rolled out in two previous assignments and we've seen some efficiency savings, particularly on the administrative side, saving some, some work time. The one that I do really wanna point out to you is the Recruit Academy. You did see a one-time uh, dollar amount for $300,000 for a Recruit Academy. Um, I just wanna put this uh, data point in your, um, on your radar screen right now. 48% of the Santa Barbara Fire Department is eligible to retire in five years or less, almost half the department. The doesn't mean they're going to retire. Remember, it will, means they are eligible to retire. I am fully expecting we will have this multi-year wave of retirements that will continue to occur, you know, five, 10 years out. Um, the majority of those positions are promoted positions, captains and above. So um, we will be you know, on a multi-year hiring process just to replace the normal retirements that are upcoming. So you will probably hear from my, my colleagues in the police department, you know, the recruitment, retention, you know, that we call it the three R's, recruitment, retention, retirement. The one that really impacts the fire department is the retirement piece. So um, we're doing our best to train folks up, to prepare them to promote into higher levels of position. I mean, literally folks right now that are getting off probation that we've have been with the city for a year will be transitioning into promoted positions in five years or less so we have to train them and then take that a step back we have to go out and hire new future firefighters so that's why you will you will see that um, in addition to that I really look at uh, this next budget year as a year of planning so you know I've been on board here about four months um, I am a I'm a planner. I'm all about putting plans together and charting the course for the future. So some things that you're going to see next year will be updating the strategic plan, updating the community wildfire protection plan. I already talked about the retirement that requires us to come up with a succession plan. We currently don't have one that basically a new employee. We give them a document, a career development guide and says, here's from day one to year 30. Here's your path, whatever path you want to choose. Uh, within the, de the department. We'll be planning and designing station two. We've talked about the attendance and scheduling system. And the fee study I do want to touch upon, we're using the same firm that did the fee study for community development. Um, and it's been at least seven years since we've done a fee study within the fire department. Um, I believe that those fees that we are charging are a lot less than what our true cost is. But in order to raise those fees, we've got to go do the fee study. So we intend to, to do a fee study uh, in, in the next budget year. Um, some other key initiatives, uh, you heard this from me uh, last week, so some of this is redundant. You know, we're refining what our role is in providing emergency medical services. Uh, we've got the, the county ambulance services and that contract. Uh, you heard me talk about the regional dispatch solution uh, that I will be coming back to you probably in late summer with. We will be deploying Pulse Point, which is a citizen engagement um, uh, and notification system that should somebody have a cardiac arrest in a public location, we would be, and we're within an eighth of a mile, we would be notified. And should we choose to get involved to render CPR or grab an AED and go place the AED on the patient, um, it also allows community members, if they hear sirens in their neighborhood, what's going on? They can open up their app on their smartphone and see, oh, there's a, you know, there's a vehicle accident down the street. That explains why I've heard all the sirens. Um, 
So that that will be will be employing uh, deploying that um, this summer actually in 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 July. Uh, we're at the tail end of implementing a fire station dispatch alerting system. So you heard me talk uh, last week about you know we sort of live and breathe response times, and this uh, this dispatch alerting system has been found to reduce turnout time, which is the time when firefighters are notified of a call to the time that wheels are rolling by upwards of 20 to 30 seconds because it's an automated system. It frees up the dispatchers from having to say that address over the air. A computer voice automatically does it. And then the last piece um, that you know, we're working very hard on is improving our data collection analysis and reporting system. So uh, I'm not happy with where our data reporting is right now. Uh, I am a data geek. Uh, you know, data can tell some very important stories that we may not be able to otherwise ascertain. So you will ex you will see some much more robust reporting coming out of the fire department uh, in the in the coming years. So those are the big things that we plan on working on next year. And now we're available for any questions. Okay, very good. I see people in the back. Did you want to make public comment? Okay. Um, we're going to take questions from the council right now. So, Mr. Rouse, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> Chief, at one point in time, if I recall, we were talking about Station 7 and potentially a cooperative effort with the Forest Service. Is that, are we just going to go ahead on our own on this, or is there going to be some kind of a, a commingled station, or how does that how does that facility look in the future? Great question. Um, I just had lunch with the Forest Service uh, Fire Chief um, uh, Chief Williams last week, and um, we are trying to work out some sort of deal where they will continue to occupy the site. We see great value in terms of getting an extra engine on the road to service the citizens of Santa Barbara. They like that station there because they obviously have their land to protect and their next closest station is 40 miles away. And because fires really don't know a jurisdictional boundary, they're not gonna stop at the Forest Service land because you know it's now county or city territory. We find great value in that. We just have to work out the actual dollars and and write the contract up. But the station you were talking about today was simply our station seven would not, it doesn't really include. I wouldn't really call theirs a station. It's more of a portable trailer yeah, with, that's, a, yeah, but, with but, a shed to park their fire engine in. Yeah. No, the station would encompass both would be, a, we would be able to park apparatus from both agencies okay. inside of a building. They don't occupy that station 24 hours a day, except under extreme fire conditions. They typically work uh, you know, a 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. schedule and then they go off duty at night. So really what they need is just some day, daytime amenities, a training room, you know, an office, those types of things. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Dominguez. I have a question on the equipment expenditures. I can't see the slide number on there. I think it may be 11. In the slide, it looks like it's 122,000. And in the budget numbers in the book, equipment seems to be in the 300 plus thousand dollar range. So I'm curious what we're thinking about in terms of expenditures for equipment. I'm trying to get to the slide there. Yes. Council member Dominguez. Yes, the question is in the budget book, you're seeing equipment at higher than that, and uh, that is a different way to present. And I believe that equipment would be transfers in, but I'd have to look at it. These numbers do tie out to the budget book. I think the budget book might have the amended budget 2019. You well, that was going to be my next question is, is why do you use the earliest number, which would be the adopted budget versus the amended or the projected, which are newer numbers as yes. your baseline. We, the reason we use the adopted budget, it's a true picture of what the actual change is. The amended budget is typically shows carryovers from the previous year's encumbered funds that were carried over into the new fund. So artificially increasing what the amended budget really is, what the adopted is. So if we had $100,000 in unspent but encumbered funds from the previous year that rolls over, carries over into the new fiscal year and shows up as an amended budget. And you're not talking about the amendments we make the following year for the second year of a budget? No, no, not you're at all. You're talking about Just, not, not when the council actually amends a budget 
Correct. Of changing some of the categories? Correct. What, that's what you're talking about? Yes, it's just, it's just the, it's primarily carryover dollars from the previous year's budgets. Okay. And isn't that a more accurate picture? Well, then we would show uh, in the amended budget, say, $200,000, when we really only budgeted that year for 100000 because we carried over $100,000. So I wanted to show current year adopted budget versus last year's adopted budget. Okay. And so the equipment here shows in the 120s. In the book, it shows, well, you have actually two categories. You have non-capital equipment and capital equipment. But the capital equipment's only sixty-seven and twenty thousand. So is this some third type of equipment category? No, it is not. I think the budget book is all the funds together. It's the fire equipment fund and the wildland fund, and this is just general fund on its own. Okay. So this doesn't include the wire wildfire no, it does not. equipment. Okay. The what was the CalPERS number? You said it pretty quickly. There was a seven million dollar number. I think yes. you said that was the increase. CalPERS, for in the adopted for plan for fiscal year 2020, is increasing from $6.5 million to the department to $7.3 million. That is almost um, $800,000 increase. And I was trying to display why um, our salary and benefits was going up by a million dollars. That much is just due to CalPERS. And, and what, what is that increase in which category? Um, retirement. So that's the city's contribution, the employee's contribution? The city's contribution. And is that because of the change in the percentage? Yes. Mr. Casey. Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, I think we've been mentioning this quite a bit, uh, that CalPERS has made a number of adjustments to the way they're managing the retirement system. They're still recapping losses from the Great Recession of the late 2000s. Uh, they've also changed the mortality rate for people living longer, and they've lowered the discount rate. And we've been showing from a citywide budget perspective that we're going to have annual increases in the $2.5 million range per year to our general fund budget. Uh, Mr. Lichty is just uh, identifying what the fire department's share of that is, which is about $800,000. It's a big number, but that is the city's contribution that needs to be increased to pay CalPERS. Thanks. And so that includes all three categories. I think it was a discount rate, the maturity, or mortality, I'm sorry. And I think there's a third category. I can't remember which one it is. Economic losses. So that's all of those. Correct. And is that number going to be relatively flat for the following couple of years, or that's the number that's growing exponentially? Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, that, that's the number that's going to be going up about that amount every year between now and 2025. So in the 2021 budget, it's also going to be a 4.5%? Yep. Okay. And how does that impact the employee's contribution? Does that stay the same year to year? Or will that also see the same percentage increase? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member D Dominguez, uh, as you know, we have a number of different bargaining units with the city, and we have different employee cost-sharing formulas with each of the different bargaining units. The general bargaining units, which is not the fire department, have a percentage cost-sharing, and so their contributions will increase year over year. Uh, the police and fire bargaining units have a fixed uh, cost-sharing formula right now, but it's negotiated between you and the bargaining units every time you have a labor agreement with them. So it'll be depending upon what you negotiate with them as part of the bargaining process. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question on uh, page G159 in the little uh, grayed out area on the right under fiscal year 2020 budget highlights at the bottom it says purchase and install faa approved and required aircraft rescue and fire firefighting uh, ancillary equipment on new apparatus would you mind just going in a little more detail as to what that is sure madam mayor council member dominguez um the gutierrez the, gutierrez sorry <laughs> that's okay my apologies um, 
the the fire department received an FAA grant to pay for the new uh, vehicle. Uh, these aircraft uh, fire vehicles are very costly. Uh, we are very aggressive with our uh, uh, seeking these grants. So what we are proposing here in this budget is just some ancillary equipment that will go on to to the vehicle. The the new, it'll be a brand new crash rescue vehicle. We should be getting it late this year. Um, it will replace one of the two existing ones that are out there. Okay, and uh, on page G160, under special projects, what what is a special project in relation to the fire department? Council Member Gutierrez, Madam Mayor. Special projects are categories of, say, road clearance, vegetation management. Um, it's projects that we are doing in the community, uh, you know, especially, you know, distinct projects, clearing land, uh, clearing roadways, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Friedman? Um, I have a couple of questions. I want to follow up on that one. So following Councilmember Gutierrez's questions on that, it, it looks like it jumps from on the special projects from 140 or so up to 408,000. Uh, why? And then it goes back down in 21, back down to 100,000. Could you count for that approximately 300,000? Yes, Councilmember Friedman, Madam Mayor. What you're looking at is the effect of having the fire academy. The fire academy was a special project of about three hundred thousand dollars, and so it's booked in that just that one year. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I have just a couple of questions. The first is um, one I, I want to thank you all for your work on securing the grant for the Wild Land Fire Protection Plan update. Uh, it's much needed, and um, I've been talking with the chief and um, others in the department about. Um, specific area that I'm getting a lot of interest from it. So one of the questions I have is I've already been contacted by um, a couple constituents about being on a committee or a commission and participation. What is the um, role of the public um, in this plan? And, and um, is there going to be a committee or how, how can they be involved in this? That's our, our fire marshal. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, uh, Joe Pore, City Fire Marshal. The uh, CWPP update um, is a long process. It's going to, uh, we've shortened it to about two years with this uh, new proposal. Um, but uh, in that process, it, it uh, uh, is built in that a lot of uh, public uh, um, participation is, is part of it. Um, what we're going to do first is, uh, in an RFPP, uh, seek uh, professional uh, consulting uh, advice on uh, the basic drawing up of a plan and the drawing up of the EIR with the help of our own city planning staff. And then as the process moves forward, uh, uh, public participation and public comment are, are part of it. Great, so, so at an appropriate time after we've done the initial planning and worked with our staff to understand the steps going forward, then we would reach out to the public and then if there is a more, uh, not just public comment, but a greater role, then we would know at that time. Exactly. Public notices and workshops and those kinds of things will be uh, will make it public that uh, we're seeking input. Okay, great. And then um, just had one performance measure on uh, page G166 in the budget books. Um, it's under emergency services and public education, um, other program measures. It says individuals reached through emergency preparedness presentations. So the actual for 2018 was uh, 5622 and the budget for uh, 19 was 1000 and we're proposing 1500 I'm just uh, like to understand what took place in 18 that was uh, 5600 and it seems 1500 to 2000 is more kind of in the ballpark and that's page G166 that he's looking at. And it's the performance measure for individuals reached through emergency preparedness presentations. I just noticed the large drop off from 18 to 19. I think the, uh, the number of cert classes plays a role in there. Um, and, uh, and we're kind of spreading that out. Uh, uh, and part of it's going to be based on OES and uh, how much our, our, our public education coordinator, Liliana, 
Encinas is, is going to be able to handle in that type of outreach. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Chief, I had a quick question about the airport. So we have increased flights. Does that change your preparedness for emergencies at the airport? Uh, Madam Mayor, great question. Uh, we are under what's called an FA index, and uh, they they index airports nationwide based upon some objective standards. And there's two primary drivers of the FA indexing. One is the size of aircraft that utilize that airport, and two is the number of passengers that move through that airport. Right now, we're indexed, I believe, at a level C. Um, now, if we continue to bring in larger aircraft, as the airport director has said, um, he said a lot of the existing airlines are, because their smaller planes are full, they're upgrading their aircraft size. And if we continue to do more business there, there is a chance that the indexing could be upgraded that would require a higher level of protection. But I believe we're still a ways off from that. We currently have three firefighters out there every day, a captain and two engineers uh, that operate that station. Round the clock, right? Correct. We hate to talk about planes crashing, but you have to be prepared for that. Correct. Okay. Well, there's no public comment, so um, people seem to be saying they're deliberative comments, but I'll just thank you. And um, somebody was just talking about fire season the other day, and I was like, well, we're always on alert, right? Uh, Madam Mayor, that is correct. Uh, fire season continues to extend, and uh, obviously the rains have been very helpful. The late rains and the cool weather is very helpful, but really for us, prime fire season is kind of midsummer into Thanksgiving. Okay, and we'll look forward to the presentation tomorrow. Are there any closing remarks from my colleagues on the fire budget? Mr. Dominguez, go ahead. I just want to say I'm very supportive of some of the efforts by the department to move forward with regionalization and cooperation. I think these are areas where we get our maximum incremental, possibly beyond incremental gains to efficiency, to turnout times. I notice that's an issue where we're trying to do better. So I think regionalization of taking a look at our EMS contracts, I think these are all great things. The more innovation we can take a look at will be great. So thank you for bringing that to the council. And we're looking forward to the strategic planning. Thanks for that. Mr. Litke, thank you. Always good to see you. Council Member uh, Sneddon, we're closing up. Um, anything that, I, 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 this is your chance. <laughs> Microphone. I, I apologize for having to miss the presentation. I'm very appreciative of the work that you're doing and that you're about to do with our um, wildland fire safety and evacuation planning. And, and I look forward to seeing some of the results of those. And, and um, thank you for securing the grant funding and I'm supportive. Great, thank Council you. Member Friedman was asking about public outreach and we heard there's gonna be rigorous public outreach in English and Spanish. It seems like we'll hear about more about that tomorrow. So we'll go ahead and close this item with thanks. And uh, the uh, police department is next. We'll let them set up. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. I am Lori Luno, your Chief of Police, and we are here obviously to present our recommended fiscal year 2020 budget. And our format and outline is gonna be as you've heard, so we will move through that. And on to our department overview. And this year I gave you an abbreviated org chart because ours gets super comprehensive. Um, what I wanna point out is we do have 211 full-time positions that 142 sworn is actually 141. Our deputy chief position that we eliminated two years ago keeps trying to creep into our stats. Um, so it actually is the 141. But we are divided into three divisions, each of which are 
run by one of our captains, and I have them here with me. We have Captain Altavilla that oversees our criminal investigations and internal operations. We have Captain Arroyo that oversees strategic operations and personnel, and then Captain Stoney that oversees field operations. And one quick question, um, we, we do a lot. Mostly the public just sees us responding to radio calls, but we do within these divisions so much more. Our dispatchers, as you know, uh, handle the bulk of the starting point for our public response. And the, this last year, I should say in 2018, they answered over 53,000 911 calls. And our special events team, and they don't get a lot of credit, which is why I'm squeezing them in, um, handled over 150 operational plans to help bring special events here, as well as 70 tactical plans to make sure those events were um, safe for the community as a whole. Our animal control, just to give you an idea, handled on average seven calls for service a day, and they impounded over 900 animals in 2018. But we have 15 programs, five different funds, um, and 20 professional service contracts that add up to be over $2.2 million. And then we do have a fleet that it exists and we manage with the, with the help of Public Works, which is over 80 vehicles. So moving on, um, our staffing, this is the percentage of where our staffing would be if we were fully staffed. And I want to take a minute to explain that. So on paper, we have three openings right now, and that includes a retirement, retirement that we just had on Friday. But when you break it down, we have 109 people for our functional staffing. So we essentially are doing what we do on a daily basis. I want to say we do it excellent um, with about 60% of our staff right now because we have three vacancies, four people in field training, seven in training at the academy. We have two of our officers that are covering our dispatch center to make sure that those positions are staffed. And then we have 16 people that are on some level of approved leave. So in saying that, we continually adjust our staffing with the ever-changing environment. And some of the things that impact us that I think are overlooked are obviously um, new legislation that comes down, and there's some big ones that are on the books for this year, and we're gonna have to adjust again in a way that takes extra work, or I should say increases our workload. It, it, it will readjust our, our workload priorities. So we're constantly involving, and just some other things this last year that really have touched us is our active shooter response. I think everybody knows that those have increased, and we've done a great job doing some training with our community, incorporating training with our schools, as well as with our fire department. Um, the need to be more transparent and uh, release public information. We at, already at this time in 2019 have had over 71 requests for PRAs, which is beyond what we had uh, last year already. Um, use of force and, and de-escalation are really important items that we're continually um, training and uh, mandating appropriate reporting so that we can release that information as we need to. We're definitely um, maintaining very positive media relations and doing a lot of that ourselves with our social media to ensure we maintain that level of public support. Um, but then the increasing mental illness and homelessness or social issues that the police are often tasked with managing. So when you look at what we do with what we have, I just hope you see what I see, we're doing an aw awesome job. So with that, we will move on to our proposed plan and I'm gonna pass the torch over to our very capable business manager, Lori Peterson. Ms. Peterson, welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. My name is Lori Peterson and I'm the business manager at the Police Department. And I'm gonna take you through the financial numbers uh, for the department for the fiscal year 2020 budget. Um, the first slide shows while we do have five funds, mostly our activity is concentrated into the three major funds you can see up here. 
with the largest fund being the general fund, which supports us at 89%. In the general fund department revenue, so the revenue that the department brings in in order to support itself, is about 10% of that, or $4.6 million, which also includes the traffic safety money, which is also looked at as its own fund. So that's why it's a little hard to account for the five funds, but they consolidate into the three. And then in miscellaneous grants, we have the COPS SLESF fund and miscellaneous grants, meaning like um, Office of Traffic Safety um, and any of the other grants that we get throughout the year, um, Bulletproof Vest Partnership and things like that. That's where that money is recorded and can be seen. Um, the total um, department revenue is 45.9 million, almost 46 million for 2020. On here, the proposed expenditures are broken down by salaries and benefits, supplies and services, allocated costs, special projects, and other. Um, just as in the fire department, the majority of the increase in our budget can be seen in the salaries and benefits for a matching percentage of 4.5%. In supplies and services, there was a slight reduction um, from the original 2019 budget to the proposed 2020 recommended budget. Allocated costs have gone up just by 2.2%. Again, those are the funds or the fees that we pay for the services we receive from other departments, such as custodial services, um, the vehicle allocations, et cetera. And then on the special project front, we have uh, fewer special projects going forward in 2020. The one um, major component in that $65,000 that you can see there is a $50,000 contract um, with the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. It's for their early identification specialists. So it's a one-year contract to con continue funding that position. Um, and then a small $15,000 that goes into the special canine um, fund that transfers in to cover their expenses. I'm sorry, that was special projects or other? Which one? Special projects okay. is that 65000 So the majority of it is the $50,000 contract. In the other, um, that one represents in uh, fiscal year 2020, we're going to be moving forward with the replacement of the mobile data computers in the vehicles. And that has been an allocation fund where it has set aside, set aside money so that we can replace um, at the end of its life cycle. So that equipment actually aged out um, two years ago. So the equipment has made it to seven years. And so we absolutely must replace it. And we will be using uh, approximately $350,000 to replace that equipment in the vehicles this coming year. So that's the majority of that 463,000 that you see um, for 2020. And the overall uh, total budget is four points is four forty six million point three. In this, this is just a graphic representation of where those expenditures are occurring. Again, eighty seven percent is going to salaries and benefits, seven percent to the supplies and services, five percent to allocated costs, and one percent to other and special projects. Some of the key budget changes um, for us this year is the addition of one position and a reclassification of one, the increase in various services and fees within the department, and again, that major project of the mobile device computers in the vehicles. The staffing changes that we've requested is the addition of an administrative analyst position, and this would be added in the business office um, as a support for doing the financial um, monthly reporting and budget and doing the necessary reports moving forward. And then a reclassification of one administrative assistant position to a police technician position to better match um, their job duties with their job title. The proposed revenues for the next, uh, for 2020, um, the major component for the department is the parking violation revenue. As you can see, that's um, $2.4 million out of $4.6 million. Um, I will talk about the specific uh, fee changes and how that increases these numbers in the next couple of slides. 
service charges. Let me catch up here. Let's see. Service charges include things like uh, ID fees, vehicle releases, false alarm fees, special events, post uh, reimbursement funds that come into the department for uh, from the state. They do uh, reimburse the department for specific types of training each year, kind of, uh, they went uh, on a reduction over the last couple of years and they're looking at evaluating and bringing back more things that will be reimbursable that are mandatory training. Um, under the JPA and uh, property for forfeiture, that represents um, our JPA agreement with the other uh, local law enforcement agencies they provide 50% uh, of the IT manager position, so that comes in, in under that line, as well as property forfeiture, so items that are not um, retrieved from our property room or vehicles um, that are um, not retrieved. Other things, permits and licenses, our taxi fee permits are included in there and licenses for dog licenses. One of the items that is showing on here that will be changing over is the crossing guards. The uh, school district uh, provides 50% of the cost of that program, but that program will be moving over to public works to be administered, and so that item will actually be moved over into their budget. It just started after the budget process had already begun, so we weren't able to kind of grab that. So I wanted to show that it was in there, but it will be moving. And then we have um, some minor donations throughout the year. Uh, Animal Control uh, receives um, money from a trust every year, and then other um, donations made through dog licenses are reflected here as well. And here's just kind of all of those incoming revenues, again, showing that parking violations are the majority of the department's revenue that comes in, followed by the service charges. So in the next section, we're going to talk about the various fees that are increasing, um, as well as parking citations. And these increases were basically needed in order to defray the costs of um, just conducting business every day. So we're trying to re catch up with where we are on the expenses. I'm going to interrupt you since yeah. you're coming to the end of one of your sections. Mm -hmm. um, so you say the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, we give them money yes. to do, uh, what is that? Madam Mayor and City Council, we have funded through our asset seizure funds the early interventionist position that was, I, I want to say, probably critical when we before Prop 47 when we had mandated drug court. Now it's evolved to they try to identify people that will be able to essentially be deferred to an additional, deferred is the wrong word, um, move to some sort of treatment court. Um, so what we've seen is a trend of reducing asset seizure funds. We haven't seen the funds replace and we approved this year one year contract um, in because we do not believe that those funds are going to continue to be reimbursed as they have in the past do we get a report back from that nonprofit on their success how do we measure what they're what they're doing with that money madam mayor we get a monthly report on the number of people that entered the program and their graduation numbers as well any other questions before we go on to the next section. Fee changes. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. So um, we looked at uh, the fees department-wide and made some recommendations across the board. Um, the total estimated revenue impact with all of these changes is less than $100,000. The first area where we made a change is in the increase in animal licensing fees. They were increased by 3%. Um, these fees haven't been increased in probably seven years, um, so it was time to do some catch-up work on that, just the, the cost of doing business, mailing the licenses, the tags themselves, working with the vendor as well. So that estimated additional revenue is $15,000. On the DUI response recovery, um, we did a 7% increase. This is the fees related to responding to an incident where 
Um, the person is arrested for b driving under the influence, and there are varying rates uh, depending on the type of response that is required. So these are called in um, calls as opposed to just um, officer initiated calls. On the alarm registration and false alarm response, um, in the city of Santa Barbara, uh, you're supposed to uh, register your alarm with the police department. That way, when we're responding, we know why the alarm is going or what that uh, alarm is tied to. And each year, the um, homeowners or business owners pay a registration fee of $40. That is not going to change. What is going to change is the response, um, the um, fee for responding to false alarms, so having to show up when there was not actually an incident occurring. If you are a register, if your alarm is registered with the police department, you have the first two false alarms are not, uh, there is no fee related for those items. If you are not registered with the city, then the impact begins immediately and the response for the first offense um, is for the first false alarm. So those are the areas where the fees will be going up. And again, the overall impact of those adjustments is approximately $6,000. In the parade and special event category, we're looking at raising the special event permit permits from $60 to $100, and then the ABC permit endorsement fee from $20 to $40. And we made um, some slight adjustments in the staffing costs for when police are um, staffing events such as the bowl or cruise ships, et cetera. So we made some adjustments there. The estimated revenue from that is approximately $2,000. The largest area where the changes were made were in parking violations. So what we recommended is a $2 increase to all parking violations across the board. And um, the estimated revenue from that to be retained by the police department is about $50,000. So a $48 parking citation will now be $50, 53 will be 55, et cetera. So, um, then the, uh, let's see, the live scan fees um, will be going forward with those. That's a minor change as well for um, nonprofits. We're going from $10, and what that is is they used to be called rolling fees for taking your rolling, your fingerprints. They're now called live scan fees because of the machines that are used. But there's a fee associated with just the staff doing that, that process, and so it's going from 10 to 12.50. And then um, the um, regular rate is going from $25 to $30. And we found that we were right in the mid-range there between us and the county and private businesses on that expense side. Uh, questions on the fees? I'll start with one. So the false alarms, that's residential and commercial? Yes. Okay. Yes. So both. Okay. Go ahead, please. I don't see any other lights. Any other? Okay, moving on to our key initiatives. These that we have up here are basically our overarching initiatives. Um, I was here two months ago with a very comprehensive update, so I'm going to go through these anticipating questions at the end. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Um, so the first, um, we're, we're going to do what we can to work with the community, as we always have, to focus on our crime, traffic, and quality of life issues. Um, we're going to continue our youth outreach, uh, specifically for prevention with PAL and the Explorer program. We are going to continue to collaborate with our other agencies, like the fire department. Our crimes don't have boundaries and cross Orders, so we know that that shared intelligence and shared resources is something that is essential to all of us. And then um, also we have a strategic plan in place for our continued recruiting efforts, um, retention, as well as wellness that I'll talk a little more about moving on when we discuss our performance and work, work objectives. So some of the key performance objectives that I be believe, the ones that I thought would be of most interest are up here is we're going to answer our calls for 911 in an average of five seconds or less. And we've been able to achieve this goal and um, we'll 
commit to continuing to do that. We know that's super important to our community safety. Um, as well as uh, respond to all of our priority one radio calls in seven minutes or less. We are committed to maintaining our staffing levels at 95% uh, for authorized and full-time positions. And as you've all heard, it's a very dynamic process. So that 95% factors in the attrition that we have and then the anticipated hiring behind. Um, and then one of the things we really want to delve into a little more is a comprehensive study of our retention rate and our key projects this year are to ensure that our employees maintain their post, which is our state standard training requirements. And that training cycle is every year and a half with post. And we're going to ensure that 95% of our staff are, are approved each training cycle by that even numbered calendar year, knowing that oftentimes we do have people on injury leave or, or military leave and that number gets delayed beyond that. But um, it is something we have to do to put a certified officer out in the field. Um, another area that we are committed to is our crisis intervention training. And that post academy is when they graduate from the Ventura County Sheriff's Academy, they come to us and we ensure that they get additional crisis intervention training that allows them to deal with the complex issues that they see on a daily basis with some of the addiction and or mental disabilities. And then um, our principal policing training, our entire department is going through this, um, continuing to go through this, but it includes our implicit bias, our cultural responses, responsiveness and policing in a democratic society. And we partner with our community and they come in and share about a three hour block in that training. Um, and I think you've heard from our city attorney who's taken the torch from here that he's gonna be working on the deemed approve off sale alcohol license ordinance and then it will come back to us for implementation, hopefully this year. Um, and then we are committed to that annual department policy manual update. And one of the things that Captain Arroyo did is um, bring this, and we use Lexipol as our provider. We have an app now. We've gotten to the point where we're able to put cell phones into our officers' hands, and we have our policy on an app. So when they have updates, they can read it. If they need to refer to policy, they can do it by a click of their finger in their car and is very user-friendly for our current um, generation of employee we have out there. And then also, as you've already heard about, um, we are going to be replacing our mobile device system this year. And then we do have a project right now with Ventura Police Department. They are linking to our records management system and our computer aided dispatch system. And by doing that, it helps as we discussed um, that concept of regionalization, it helps keeps cost, keep costs down for both agencies, but the data sharing is available. And um, I, I do believe that this is, going to be more prevalent in the future and something that we all need to rely on. Um, and then, as you all know, and you've heard it with the capital projects that were already presented, um, we're hopefully going to be working towards a new police station. We've been actively engaged and have and will continue to put quite an effort into the planning and design of the new station, knowing that it needs to fit our needs. And then some of our key efforts, we have an opioid crisis in this nation. We are um, going to be training our officers on deployment of some Narcan um, devices, as well as per the county recommendation, um, having some AEDs roll out in our patrol cars. And it's Department Health, of Health's recommendation that you have the both, that you have those automated defibrillators and the Narcan should you have um, a crisis. So we're in, we ended up getting some, how many of them? Seven? Seven given to us from the fire department because they re reinforced their um, supply 
of AEDs and we'll be trying to find a way to get some more um, as we roll that out. But you all know we've been here many times. We are collaborating on the HEAP grant. We are committed to um, collaborating on the tobacco grant. Um, I mentioned our recruitment strategic plan. In essence, we've found a way to increase our process. We have a um, customer service approach now that I really think is making a difference. And I know Captain Arroyo has a lot more detail on that, but it's, it's creating the buzz about our department and making sure that those very few applicants that are out there and everybody's competing for, that we're grabbing them first and engaging them and, and basically seeing a positive result with them committing to come with us. Um, and then we did carve out some additional um, capacity of our staff to implement our employee wellness component and we are finishing our policy on peer support so we have some designated staff that can be that peer level um, support should our employees want to take advantage of them guiding them through a process. We still have our at ease program that is the formalized process, but it's um, a nice and basically common practice these days to have that peer level support for anybody that should be in need. Um, and then we hope to expand our volunteer program and, and what they do. As you know, we're up to 14 now. Um, one of the things that have really, because we have so many people out with different leaves and whatnot. Um, our background process has been bogged down with us trying to get officers hired, our parking enforce, uh, enforcers hired, and unfortunately, when it comes down to it, our volunteers, as vital as they are to us, the backgrounds sometimes are pushed because we have some other pending priorities, but we are committed to expanding that program as well. And with that, we will open it up for questions. All right, we'll take some questions. Mr. Shack, if you wanted to, no, to, um, we probably won't have any public comment. So Mr. Rouse and then Mr. Dominguez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Chief, uh, going back to your, one of your very first slides about the number of sworn, I'm, I'm still a little confused. So we're authorized 142 sworn, but you mentioned it was one, 141. Um, I correct it. We are authorized 141. It used to be 142 when yeah, we had our that. deputy chief. Okay, so, but, and I don't know, maybe Mr. Casey can answer this. Are we still authorized to overhire to, to uh, cover, obviously, potential or anticipated retirements as well as all the IOD and things were? Madam Mayor, Council Member Rouse, our goal is to fill those three positions with this next hiring cycle and get those four overhires. We have not had the opportunity to overhire since I've been here, right. but I want to say we have some, what I, what I believe is some really good people in our background process. Okay. And then uh, in the tobacco dollars, um, were there funds available for overtime for patrol in that, that as I understand, and, and are those being implemented? Madam Mayor, Council Member Rouse, yes, we got off to a slow start in regards to keeping up with the funds that were allocated, and I don't want to misquote the numbers, but it, I, I did see uh, Nina Johnson's presentation. I believe it was the range of 350000 for the first couple years. Um, we have been on a cycle. We increased the patrol staffing available for that grant and we have not seen openings uh, be left behind. So we're getting the officers that are filling them and then we are now adding an evening element that are gonna give us the opportunity for additional support out there do during our nightlife enforcement for the smoking grant and other things. All right, and then regarding the, uh, the, the, the apps that the, you know, the police will have access to on their cell phones, you're not suggesting they're going to drive distracted, are you? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Mr. Dominguez. So I had questions regarding your measures and objectives related to uh, homeless persons on G300. And these are in, in other program measures. And I'm curious, first of all, it seems like this has become such a, a big ticket item at council. Is this something that you would consider moving into measurable I objectives? It. I don't know if that makes a difference in how you treat them operationally. And 
in 2019, we had budgeted 84 placements and recoveries. Our projected is 54 and then proposed is 75. Is there anything we can do or is there anything more optimistic than what we're seeing here? Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, I, I think our HEAP grant will increase those numbers for sure. So we base this on our permanent staff that we currently have allocated our additional restorative position, or I should say filled position we will have with overtime will definitely sh or should increase that number. But it is on average, we manage uh, about a caseload of 50 per month from our restorative unit but we do max our capacity with that. Yeah, and, and the concern is just the actual number for, for 18 was 85, so this represents downward by 10 people. And it seems like we've got more resources now than ever, there's more homeless now than ever. And um, I don't know if that's because there's other agencies that are providing that service, and so we're just facing a more competitive environment. I, I'm not sure where we have more homeless than ever before. Like you just said, the number came down, I think, in the count. But go ahead, Captain Stoney. Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, uh, this number is based on a three-year average. So what you're seeing is last year we were very aggressive with that, and we're hoping to continue that. So we'd like at the end of the year to, to bump the number up again. But the 75 is reflective of a three-year average. So that's where we're looking at where our goal is. But again, we're very optimistic considering last year we had the 85. Okay. And the, uh, in the measurable objectives, maintain the restorative policing programs with a minimum of 35 active cases at all times. Is that also a three-year average and that's just based on the number of personnel you have assigned to that unit? This is on uh, Madam Mayor, Council well. Member Dominguez, yes, they're all three-year averages, and we, um, when I first ha got here, we had one person restorative, and we did up that to two, so it's likely we will see that number increase. So shouldn't we increase our goal if we're throwing more resources at it? We, I will want to say we can, but we, we're, I'm confident we'll get there, but we were being conservative with the three-year average. Okay, the um, next question relating to response times on 317. And I notice uh, we're particularly off with the P3 non-emergency calls. And I'm wondering if, if maybe that signals either a different approach to these calls, um, if it maybe signals, um, maybe we need to look at other ways to reduce the number of calls to begin with. What is your take when you see these statistics? And I guess the other place, these P3 calls, there was another page. So G20. G28 gives the total number of P3 non-emergency calls, projected 9,000 this year, and we're proposing 8,700. So I see that as a big problem because it's so many calls and we're not hitting our goals. So what can we do as a city to help you by reducing the number of calls to begin with? Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, this argues I think the change of our approach to policing, as I mentioned, we we're hit with a lot of things evolving in our community. So it's fair to ask, how can we provide a different ser service delivery model, which, you know, the, not that the volunteers have taken away much of that workload, but that's one idea that they will be out there to handle some of those non emergency issues. One of the things we did do is we expanded our online reporting. We are at the point where we need to advertise that more. We expanded it to Spanish as of recent. There are 21 reports that people can 
uh, can initiate online. And in addition, we are now encouraging people to come in for their non-injury collisions to the police station to fill out the proper work paperwork themselves. It's essentially an insurance report. So that is one of the things, and that was something we looked at. We went to over 1,100 of those calls. If we were called and people need us because they see that somebody doesn't have a license, doesn't have insurance, there's conflict, we will be there. But it is essentially an, an insurance report, and we're encouraging people to either fill one out online or to go to the station to fill out a counter report for that. And, and which stat capture that or, or which program measures on page G328? One of the things, uh, phone calls from outside lines, is that just an aggregate of all of these calls? Would they be caught up in that number? Like these police reports for a traffic collision? Where would we see those numbers? I can't, can you see? I have to apologize. I can't even see it. I don't have my glasses, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm going to have Captain Alta Villa answer this. That's fine, Chief. Thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, I'm on. Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, they uh, wouldn't be bifurcated out. They would be calls for service that would come in on our 911 calls or our seven digit line. So they would be encumbered in that aggregate number. As far as a response time is concerned, if our communication center could go ahead and have the parties just merely exchange information and not have to send out an officer, then that would be reflected in our priority calls for service, which is on, I think, um, under uh, field operations as far as priority uh, two, three, and four calls for service. So we're hoping that uh, our ability for our communication center, which they do a good job already, handling those uh, on the phone will reduce our officers' calls for service in those specific priority calls. So those are lumped into P4s, like the traffic collision reports? They, it, 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 they could be. I mean, a lot of these depend on whether they're injury or non-injury, but if they're typically just uh, non-injury related and they can exchange information, then they would probably fall under the priority four calls for service. So what is the phone calls from outside lines program measure? We have um, two different ways that you can go ahead and get phone calls that come in. One come in on our 911 trunk lines, uh, and the other ones come into the same facility. They just come in on 10-digit ten digit, ten digit lines. So they're just two separate counts. Okay. And... The non-emergency calls for service, the P3, so does that line up with nuisance calls? Council member, what, what uh, page are you on now? On G323, it lists four different uh, areas where there's nuisance-related crimes within the downtown corridor. So there's 3,200 proposed in 2020, beachfront area 1,400. So I'm just trying to figure out how that would relate to your P ranking system. Is that a priority three non-emergency calls because it's nuisance related? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Mayor Dominguez, it depends on if it's a crime in progress or if it's a check the welfare. It could fall underneath priority two if it was in progress or it could fall under priority three. Okay. And so then the same type of question I would ask for these program measures, how do we reduce these nuisance-related crime call for service. And um, that's why I'm curious if we're upping our goals because of the HEAP and tobacco-related grants, because at the same time, once those monies run out and we're sitting here three years from now and you're saying, hey, those, those resources aren't available, I'd want to see the goals drop because that would signal to us we need different resources either for the PD or we need resources to departments external to PD to help alleviate those those problems. So that's... Part of the reason I'm asking how we're going to deal with these in terms of the goals, and um, sounds like the staffing level levels aren't as much of, a, of an issue, or does that impact the restorative function and the HEAP, how we're going to execute the HEAP grant? Because as I understand it, aren't we upping our resources because of HEAP 
in terms of restorative justice? Council member uh, Dominguez, we are filling that restorative extra position with overtime, meaning an officer volunteers to do it on overtime. So we, we don't have the ability to s assign a full-time staff member there, so that's how we've chosen to fill it. So it's still going to be two personnel? Two full-time, and then we should have that third as the extra person through the HEAP grant. So we're going to have three officers available? <laughs> Council Member Dominguez, it depends how we roll it out. So we have the funding for one full extra time officer, but um, we may roll it out instead of just one officer 40 hours a week or, or to that um, breakdown, we might decide to do a joint outreach effort and bring in a couple on a particular day to work with our city net and other resources so that our resources can be more fruitful. So I'm concerned this decision hasn't been made. I think you guys saw me give the cottage people a hard time because they haven't hired their nurse. And um, so who's going to be kind of managing that for the department and when will we get more certainty? Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, Lieutenant Aaron Baker is managing it. We knew from the beginning we were not going to be able to put a full-time officer in there with our staffing challenges, so our intent was to fill it with overtime resources. We've already been doing that, and I believe it was, I don't want to misquote the numbers, um, but we had one detail out there so far that I know specifically we had some very positive results. Great. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Great. We have some other lights on. Mr. Uh, Friedman. Great. Um, you know, recently, we, I think the, all the council received an email about a noise issue on the west side. And then um, your response back to me, Chief, was that, um, and the response from the constituent was the program SNAP with City College. Could you, this gets into the additional resources and partnerships, and um, I wasn't too familiar with that. So if you could just explain what SNAP is and how um, how it's, the relationship works and, and if it, you think it's beneficial for us. Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, our SNAP program is our student noise abatement program and it is a collaboration with City College and it came through in about 2015 or 16, I believe, right when I got here and it was, um, determined that there is a new, I should say it was voted upon, we have a, an ordinance in particular that has a administrative penalty attached to noise complaints. And the intent of the program is to focus on some of our city college related noise issues. We can expand that and, and have seen some broader application, but the, the intent is to have a student um, employee that makes contact and has the ability to hopefully um, be more persuasive than the criminal element uh, that we would enforce. So they roll out, they give residents warnings, and if those warnings are not heeded, then they um, escalate the civil penalty with return responses. So we have had some challenges with our hiring. Um, we have thrown many resources to that. I know we interviewed about 12 in individuals recently, and we're hopeful we're, we have foreign backgrounds right now, so we're, our hope is to expand that program and get the resources out there. And um, with the, the challenges that you just mentioned, it, do you think this program is beneficial? Is it helping us uh, be more, I guess, the cost benefit for the resources that we invest versus the return that we're, we're getting? Is it something that is worth us to continue? It seems like it is. Council Member Friedman, yes, I believe it is, but I think the biggest side of that is the um, quicker response that we can give to the community and deal with the issue, because it is one of those lower priorities and one that has a tendency to stack until we finish with some higher priority calls. Okay, um, thank you for that, that update on that program. Uh, just have a couple of questions. I think it's on page uh, 318. Uh, it gets to the um, 
homeless uh, or the transit camp cleanup details. So we had, we're at, at budgeting for about 40. In terms of um, resources, what types of resources would you typically deploy for a, um, a cleanup? And, and where I'm getting at is the, the amount of resources that we're taking off of maybe other priority calls. Uh, how often are we doing encampments and then uh, cleaning encampments and then the type of resources that are involved? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Freeman, that is run through our neighborhood policing unit, specifically our uh, street crimes unit, which is currently staffed by a sergeant and two officers. When we do identify a place, uh, location that needs a full camp cleanup, uh, 72 hours prior, we'll go out, we'll post that area, notifying who's ever occupying that, that in 72 hours we'll do a cleanup. We then work through city environmental services who schedule an outside company that comes in to actually do the cleanup. The police department will stand by during the course of that cleanup and take any enforcement action necessary. So it is a fairly lengthy three-day process to do a full camp cleanup. And here it says we're proposing about 40, so we're doing these every couple of weeks or so? We try to do that. Again, it's based on um, the need. Sometimes we'll do two or three a week. Um, we did use part of the heat grant not too long ago and partnered and uh, were able to not only clean up the area but get some housing resources to some of the folks who are living in those areas. Great. I bet you got to my next question is how the heat grant is uh, affecting our ability to be more strategic and then also getting others into services so hopefully we can address some of these issues. Um, appreciate the update. And my last question is on um, other program measures on page 323. I, I just noticed um, that there's specific areas, uh, downtown Milpas and Waterfront, uh, but up in um, up, uptown in San Roque area, we're getting a lot of uh, constituent calls um, or raising it to our attention, burglary, mail theft, those types of crimes. Um, in addition, on next door, there's a lot of postings about uh, neighborhood vigilance. And I know there was a, um, a community meeting with um, one of your staff recently, um, last week, uh, took place during a council meeting. Um, but I just want to understand maybe in the future or why that those areas um, aren't part of the other program measures, if we could maybe have some statistics for those areas in the future so we understand what, what types of crimes are that are taking place up there and how we're responding to them. And just in general, how do we respond um, in that part of town? Absolutely. Council Member Friedman will work to find a way to do that. And we don't have to wait for these. We can give you our beat breakdowns on on crime and trends we see that could be helpful. They don't align with council districts, but close enough that you could get a good feel. Yeah, and, and if you could send me those, I'd just like to understand because I, I think Council Member Stedden, I don't want to speak for you, but she's also getting, we're, our districts overlap in very, uh, these neighborhoods, and we're both getting those, and we're both part of that next door feed, and, and it's kind of, um, we're both being contacted. So if we could get that information, much appreciated. Thanks. Council Member Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you for the report. I have a question about the uh, information and technology crime analysis on page G338, where you you mentioned it in your presentation about completing phase two of the multiple jurisdictional computer-aided dispatch with Ventura County or Ventura Police. So I was wondering, are they going to pay for that service or are we paying them or is there like a 50-50? Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, they do pay us um, as to the amount. I'm hoping Mary Linda has an idea, but um, it, 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 they are helping to fund the support as well as their use of our system, if you will. And can you just elaborate? So they're going to have access to the criminal records that the SBPD has and vice versa, you're going to have access to the criminal records that Ventura County has? I will or let Captain Arroyo answer. She's actually working on the project, so she can do a much better job explaining than I. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Gutierrez, yes, um, right now any law enforcement agency in California or actually um, nationwide can re request information from us on any given time um, if they have the need to know, right to know. 
Uh, what this does is it's a Versadex, which is a company based out of Canada that we utilize for our records management system as well as our computer-aided dispatch. Ventura Police Department has recently switched over to that and they're going through the process um, and they are paying us for services that we are providing to support them. And Versadex, the company itself, is actually the backbone of giving them the majority of the service pr providing. Um, and they do pay us a fee for that um, and an ongoing maintenance fee. Uh, the exact amount, unfortunately, I couldn't exactly quote you. And, and why is that? Is it because we have a, a better maintained system? Like, do we have more server room? And um, it is because we originally switched over to Versadex back in 2007 and implemented the change ourselves and did a complete changeover. So we have over 10 years experience with the program and we can foster a lot of shared responsibilities with them and understanding and how it works. That saves them a tremendous amount of time and effort. It also enables us to share information with the city of Ventura and the things that come through our city. Um, so it's actually um, beneficial from both sides. Okay, so it's not unusual to have uh, two different city departments communicating with each other when it comes to information like this? No, actually it, um, in other states, it's actually the preferred method and in Canada, it is the method. Got it. And just another random question, um, does the police department have the ability, if there's a crime with no witnesses, to search through cell phone pings to see if maybe they can identify who committed the crime even though there was no witnesses? Hmm. You, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Member Gutierrez, that is um, a very difficult question to answer, particular depending upon the circumstances, the type of crime, what cell towers are up, what devices may or may not be used, and what Fourth Amendment rights would need uh, to be surveyed and search warrants conducted. Um, pings can and can't be um, assistant. It kind of depends upon the circumstances and what social media used. Um, mm -hmm. That is more into the digital evidence um, and the proper court paperwork to be done. In theory, um, anything can be looked at digitally um, depending upon the circumstances. Thank you. Council Member Snedden. Um, thank you. I first want to say that um, like we do see what you see, that you're doing excellent work with the limited resources that you have right now, and, and thank you for outreach to, to bring up to staffing and um, for the volunteers also. And I do have some questions. Um, one about the retention rate studies. Are, will that be looking at what factors affect retention rate or how much it costs the department when we lose a trained officer to moving somewhere else or um, just what will it be looking at exactly? Um, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Member Snedden, um, the retention rate looks at a lot of different factors. Um, what keeps our people invested here as well as what attracts them as well as what things we could do better and that, so that's a, a global perspective, per se. We are looking at all, er, anything and everything and also what other agencies are doing and what other industries are doing. Um, how could we do things differently? And how do we progress with the new generations and the new challenges that we have? Okay, thank you. And will we see the results of that this year, this study, or is that something longer term? Um, Madam Mayor and Council Member Snedden, I would absolutely say that you would see some type of results. We would certainly want to share that um, with this body and making sure that um, everyone is a recruiter for us mm -hmm. and understands our challenges and how we can move forward together. Thank you. Um, and then I, I did have the opportunity to meet several explorers who are just highly dedicated mm -hmm. to the program and, and one that one shared with me is that by working through that program for several years that then they are really dedicated to staying local and, and feel vested and it seems like a really excellent program. I have questions about, um, let's see, on G304, some of the variability in those numbers and maybe it's just three-year averages, I don't know, um, but I wanted to ask about that. We have the Explore Post Volunteer Community Service Hours. Um, those seem to be going up, but PAL meetings and events, 
almost, I don't know, that seems like quite a decrease. Maybe you could just talk about the public meetings and presentations. They're high, and then they go to 294, and then up. Just some of the variability in there on that particular page, community and media relations. You're asking about the public meetings and presentations line item? Well, I think I'm asking about each of those. They seem to go, um, you know, neighborhood improvement task force meetings seems relatively stable, but sort of the PAL meetings and events, it goes from 418 and then proposed is 255, um, but then the hours in the post-voluntary community service hours go way up, and I'm, I'm just wondering about the fluctuation. variability, yeah. Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, I know these combined um, areas that our beat coordinators specifically focus on and then some that are more general and we have other support from our officers. So we, with our staffing challenges, have reduced our beat coordinators down to three right now. Fortunately, one's been on an extended leave, so we have taken that into consideration. Um, just for that particular unit, but we do have the support of our patrol officers knowing that that is where we're putting our resources right now to respond and attend those meetings. So some of those numbers may go back up again once we're fully staffed. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And then um, under the crime lab section, if you could just give us an idea of the status of our rape kits? Are they we up to date yes, with those or? Uh, Madam May Mayor, Council Member Stedden, we are up to date and I've checked on that twice this year and we have been up to date every time I've asked. That's so excellent, thank you. When you hear that nationally, how they're backlogged and not taken as seriously, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, then in G332, um, I was just wanted to ask about the status of human trafficking investigations completed. It, it seems to be grouped with vice and narcotics. And I was wondering, the number goes down, and I was wondering, is that because the rates are going down or just investigations going down on, on 332? Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, again, that's going to be a three-year average, and that's one of those details uh, when it comes to staffing that fluctuates a little bit with our narcotics unit. Um, just like our BCs, if from an investigative perspective, uh, if I don't have the people to go ahead and put in my division, I'm probably going to go ahead and be a little leaner in narcotics versus some of the other ones where we actually have crimes against persons, crimes against property. Um, so that's, again, it's going to be a three-year average and a, uh, a deployment. Okay. issue and then those three are are sort of grouped together narcotic vice and human trafficking and i'm i'm wondering specifically about the human trafficking numbers if they seem to be level or do we know you know at this particular point in time i, I don't have those numbers bifurcated out but we can we can get them to you because they all lumped in as far as this p3 goal here yeah thank you i know you're working diligently on that i was just interested in that number and then um, domestic violence specifically is, do we have, how are the trends on that? Do we have preventative programs or education or, or what is, what are things we're doing on that front? Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, I know this last year we did roll out a, cons a, a comprehensive training element. The uh, district attorney had a video. I attended a briefing where they had a, a uh, district attorney liaison that was there doing some additional education. Going back to my memory with our aggravated assaults were slightly up in 2018. One of the areas were domestic violence, but I think we have educated our folks and hopefully I want to say that was spiked by some education and reporting standards. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell if, if the actual domestic violence is going up or the reporting is going up. And, and do those tend to involve guns or not as much? I, Council yeah. Member um, Snedden, I don't think we can make a direct correlation. Um, I, sometimes they do. 
but um, I, I'd say more often than more often they do not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then one one more question about um, traffic. So G three twenty one. Um, again, I'm just uh, looking at the um, at the goals to maintain the total number of injury traffic collisions at or below 100% of the most recent three-year average, and I see 504, 500, 500, and then 514, and then the one below it um, going up to 1515 for traffic collisions. I'm just looking at those numbers going up and, and wonder if you could just clarify, are we expecting more traffic collisions, or is that, again, that three-year average? Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, again, the three-year average is what we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for this presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and I, too, echo my appreciation for all the work that you all do. Um, I just had a couple questions about um, Narcan. I'm really, really pleased to see that that is a key effort for you. Um, Opioid addiction is, is obviously such a problem nationally, but it, it touches us here in Santa Barbara, and I think it's really easy for us to overlook that. Um, I'm curious about how you guys are conceptualizing using Narcan with the force. I mean, I know it's so expensive, and it's been really difficult to get a hold of. Are you looking to have Narcan at, at, with every unit? Is that, and where are you in terms of how much you have available now? Madam Mayor, Council Member Harmon, I believe we have 70 units um, that we purchased and that would be enough to have it in every patrol car okay. and then have some additional for our investigative staff um, should they encounter it. And, and then also we were talking about having that in the station itself in case we have a need with somebody possibly bringing a substance in. Okay, awesome. And um, do you have any information and, and Certainly you don't have to answer now. It may just be something for the future about how often Narcan is deployed by your officers. I'd be very interested to see those numbers in our community. And Madam Mayor and Council Member Harmon, one of the things that um, we have here that works in our favor is a fire department that's very close and responsive. So we haven't had it in the field, so we haven't deployed it. I know the county has seen some increases and has those numbers. Um, with, I think that, that that alone adds to the support of having some level of a program for us as well. Awesome, and my final question on this is, um, when you do use the Narcan, do you guys do any cost recovery with that? I assume not, but just curious. Madam Mayor and Council Member Harmon, um, no, we won't, and that's okay. one of those medical needs that um, we wouldn't want to cross that line. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I, ha I had a question about text to 911. You know, when you look through this, there's so many, you do a lot of different kinds of things and just really interesting tidbits in here. So what is, what is that program? Madam Mayor, I will let uh, <laughs> Captain Altavilla, there's so many detail in all these programs. I rely yeah. on these guys, and this is their opportunity. They own the programs, and I want them to be able to share. Of course. Uh, Madam uh, Mayor, uh, Text to 911 is just a, another, it's going to be a countywide program, another way for the public to go ahead and get information to our combined communication center, oh. just like we did with uh, uh, hard, uh, hard line uh, phones, and now we transition to cell phones uh, with uh, transfer to the CHP and our ability to go ahead and actually get people's location through uh, uh, lat long. This will be another element that we will be rolling out uh, for people to go ahead and get information uh, to communications through text messages. Okay, very good. It's been a, a good round of questions, and I'll um, start the closing remarks because we don't have <clears throat> any members of the public that want to speak. Um, gosh, I really do support updating the fees, the fee rates, and anything that promotes cost recovery for um, staff labor and other city resources. I've been hearing that as a theme, actually, throughout our whole budget um, discussion. So by all means, we should be charging what, um, what it's worth. 
and um, uh, thanks for the update. You come every six weeks or whenever you, you're regularly here letting us know how things are going and we've given you a lot of information or you've heard from our concerns. So th thanks for listening and responding. Uh, I think you're gonna send some written information to people and I would remind my colleagues you can always write questions ahead of time and then the answers might be there. If you know yesterday or even this morning you had got questions about this or that, you might be able to have answers uh, for us today. So are there any other closing remarks uh, for the, our chief and her staff? Mr. Dominguez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think the uh, department's doing an excellent job, so I wanna give praise to, to your department, your staff, sworn and unsworn. I hear lots of compliments on a daily basis. Um, I wish we had more of you, and uh, you're doing a great job recruiting in a particularly tough environment, not locally, but nationwide. Not only is, is I think, public service more difficult nowadays, but just the unemployment rate around the country is just really low. So you're comp competing with employers of all, all ilk. So you're doing a great job given, given those difficulties. Um, the increase in, in the unsheltered homeless, the increase in, in nuisance-related crimes and calls for service is, is a huge burden on your department. And I'm afraid the state government, the county government, our city hasn't done enough to help you with that burden for reducing the population that's committing a, a clear majority of those calls. Um, we're spending five to $10 million uh, between you and fire on cleanups and enforcement, and we're only spending a million dollars on permanent solutions. So my personal view is we need to start upping the permanent solution because it's, it's Sisyphean. Every day you guys gotta go out and deal with the same population, and we're not getting them off the streets into returning them to their families, getting them back into the workforce, getting them into recovery. Um, the fact that we only have two and now we have three restorative officers, that's, that's great in terms of hopefully that extra person will really help, but we need to increase the ability of nonprofits to work with you, with Cottage Hospital, with everyone we can to, um, to solve that problem because it's creating not only problems for your department, but for our, our economy, for our businesses, particularly downtown. Um, that's one of the most common complaints we hear from business owners and people who shop downtown is the, uh, the crime and their perception, their fear. Um, I really appreciate your efforts collaborating with other agencies and looking at things regionally. Your work with youth, your work with PAL, um, your great improvements with dispatch. And I really, someone who studied psychology and, and worked in mental health, I think your work with the crisis intervention training is great and I wanna see you successful in that effort. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. And Chief, thanks for sending a couple of officers to the community job fair a couple of Saturdays ago. I think they got to talk to a few people. Um, so thank you. We'll close the police item. Mr. Casey, we have one big department presentation left. So it's Public Works on Wednesday, May 29th, 2.30 p.m. right here in Council Chambers. Anything to add or we're ready to adjourn to tomorrow? Uh, officially the whole council at two, but we have a closed session at 11 related to labor negotiations and then the finance committee is meeting ordinance, getting a break this, this Tuesday. Okay, uh, meeting adjourned. <laughs>